bringing us through the book of Revelation, the book of Daniel. It's been a great year, Lord, and it's amazing just how quickly time passes by. Here we are tonight, Daniel chapter 12. What a great book, Lord. I just I love it, and I thank you for uh, inspiring Daniel to write it exactly as you wanted him to write it, so that what we have today is, is your word. So, Lord, we love you. I thank you for what you're doing in all of our hearts. I pray that you'll continue to work on our hearts tonight as we spend time in your word. It's in your name that I pray. Amen. Amen. I've entitled tonight's message, The Last Days. Again, take your Bible and turn to Daniel chapter 12. Um, Dr. John Walford, uh, who died back in 2002, he was a former uh, past chancellor of Dallas Theological Seminary, and he wrote a commentary on Daniel. I want you to listen to what he wrote. And he wrote this probably, you know, uh, 20 years ago because he wrote it before, you know, several years before he died. He said, for Christians living in the age of grace and searching for understanding of these difficult days, which may be bringing to a close God's purpose in his church, the book of Daniel has never before cast a broad light upon contemporary events foreshadowing the consummation which may not be far distant. If God is reviving his people Israel politically, allowing the church to drift into indifference and apostasy, and permitting the nations to move toward centralization of political power, it may not be long before the time of the end will overtake the world. He goes on to say, when the plan of God has run its full course, it will be evident then with even more clarity than at present that God has not allowed a word to fall to the ground. As Christ said while on earth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. If, if there's one thing, men, that we should have learned this year, it's this. If God says it, He means it. If it's written in the Bible anywhere, it's going to happen. And you can take that to the bank. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19 says, And we have the word of the prophets made more certain, and you will do well to pay attention to it, as to a light shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Last week we spent a great deal of time talking about the time of Jacob's trouble. I believe that Israel is headed once again into the refining fire of God. I believe that God's plan is to purge Israel of the dross that con contaminates her heart in order that a remnant might shine forever. And that brings us to Daniel chapter 12. So beginning with verse 1, follow with me. Daniel writes for us, At that time Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will arise. Again, this is Gabriel speaking to Daniel, telling him what's going to happen. He goes on to say, there will be a time of distress such as not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But the, at that time, your people, who are his people? The Jews. At that time, your people, Daniel, everyone whose name is found written in the book will be delivered. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness will shine like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, close up and seal the words of the scroll until the time of the end. Many will go here and there to increase knowledge. Then I, Daniel, looked, and there before me stood two others, one on this bank of the river and one on the opposite bank. One of them said to the man clothed in linen, who is above the waters of the river. How long will it be before these astonishing things are fulfilled? The man clothed in linen, who is above the waters of the river, lifted his right hand and his left hand toward heaven. And I heard him swear by him who lives forever, saying, it will be for a time, times, and half a time. So we, we got a picture here of the pre-incarnate Christ raising both of his hands to his heavenly Father and swearing. Do you think that's going to come true? He said, when the power of the holy people has been finally broken, all these things will be completed. I heard 
but I did not understand. So I asked my Lord, what would the outcome of all this be? And he replied, go your way, Daniel, because the words are closed up and sealed until the time of the end. Many will be purified, made spotless and refined, but the wicked will continue to be wicked. None of the wicked will understand, but those who are wise will understand. From the time that the daily sacrifice is abolished and the abomination that causes desolation is set up, there will be 1,290 days. Blessed is the one who waits for and reaches the end of the 1,335 days. Let me go and tell you, I don't know what that means. Okay? And I'm not sure anybody does. A lot of people guessing. We'll figure that out one of these days. The 1,290 days is the same as time times and half a time, or three and a half years. So we can figure that part out. I'm just not sure about the 1,335 days. That's 45 more days. So something in that 45-day period is going to happen. One day we'll know. But it says, blessed is the one who waits for and reaches the end. As for you, go your way to the end. He's speaking to Daniel. You will rest, and then at the end of the days, you will rise to receive your allotted inheritance. You think Daniel has received a great inheritance? Yes. Yeah. Now from this passage, I'd like to show you how the last days will unfold and what will happen in the end. First, as I said last week, the last days will witness a great time of distress for the nation of Israel. Verse 1 makes this clear. Gabriel informs Daniel that the end will be a time of great distress for his people, the Jews. It will be worse than anything the world has ever witnessed. Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 21, For then there will be great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be equaled again. Jesus went on to say, If those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. Who's going to shorten them? God. I personally believe another holocaust is on the horizon. It will be far worse than the one brought upon the Jews by the Nazis, which is hard to imagine. Are we near this time of distress? I don't know. No one does. But things appear to be lining up. The pieces seem to be in place. And here's my advice, men. Be a student of God's Word. This summer, what should you keep on reading? The Bible. Keep one eye on Israel and keep the other eye focused on Iran, Turkey, and Russia. If Iran acquires nuclear capability, which they're working on, they will be in a position to accomplish in about six minutes what it took Hitler nearly six years to do, the extermination of six million Jews, which is about how many Jews are living there now, maybe seven million, but somewhere, that's how many are living in Israel today. And be clear about this, Iran has the support of Russia and their leader Putin. In fact, you can already see Russia, Iran, and Turkey coming together. The National Interest, which I wasn't even familiar with, is a magazine that reports on the interest of American foreign policy in world affairs. And it stated that on February the 14th, 2019, leaders from three of Eurasia's major powers met at Russia's Black Sea seaport of, of Sochi. Spelled S-O-C-H-I. Sochi. Whatever. <laughs> we pronounce it Sochi in Bethel. I don't know what you guys pronounce it. <clears throat> anyway, they met there at this place that I can't pronounce to discuss Syria. In attendance were the host, President Vladimir Putin, Turkey's President Erdogan, and Iran's President Hassan Rouhani. While Syria was the main focus of the meeting, the summit represents an important development, the increasing convergence of national interests between Iran, Russia, and Turkey. And this happened back in February, just about a month ago, or two months ago. So I believe that God's prophetic clock, which is not moving right now, is about to start ticking. The end is approaching. And at some point in the future, an evil leader, according to Scripture, will arise. And it appears that he will lead a coalition of Muslim nations. And they will invade the beautiful land of Israel. And if that happens, Israel will pass through the fire once again, and many Jews will be killed. However, a remnant will survive. Look at verse 1 in Daniel, chapter 12, verse 1. 
It says, at that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will arise. There will be a time of distress such as not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people, again, he's talking about Daniel's people, the Jews, everyone whose name is found written in a book will be delivered. The prophet Zechariah was born in Babylon during the time of, of the exile, about the same time as Daniel lived. And he was among those who returned to Judah in 538 B.C. In the last three chapters of the book of Zechariah, chapters 10, 11, and 12, concern the time of the end. They're fascinating. I wish we had time to read them tonight. I believe that these three chapters are talking about the time. I think Zechariah's looking into the future just like Daniel did and just like John did on the island of Patmos. And he's seeing the second coming of Jesus Christ. And I believe that Jesus will be returning to defeat Israel's enemies, to purge Israel of its sin, to establish His everlasting kingdom on earth, and then to judge the nations. Listen carefully to, to the words of this great prophet from Zechariah chapter 12, verses 1 through, through 6. It's in your outline. Zechariah writes, This is the word of the Lord concerning Israel. So whose word is this? It's God's word. He says, the Lord who stretches out the heavens, who lays the foundations of the earth, and who forms the spirit of man within him declares, I am going to make Jerusalem a cup. The cup in Scripture always contains the wrath of God. So he fills up this cup, then he pours it out. I'm going to make Jerusalem a cup that sends all the surrounding peoples reeling. Judah will be besieged as well as Jerusalem on that day. Remember, that's... that's that expression we've been talking about, the day of the Lord. On that day, when all the nations of the earth are gathered against her, against who? Israel. I will make Jerusalem an immovable rock for all the nations. All who try to move it will injure themselves. Israel has got Michael and, and God protecting her. On that day, I will strike every horse with panic and its riders with madness, declares the Lord. I will keep a watchful eye over the house of Judah, but I will blind all the horses of the nations. Then the leaders of Judah will say in their hearts, the people of Jerusalem are strong because the Lord Almighty is their God. Now keep in mind the symbolism in Scripture. So I don't think they're really talking about literal horses. I could be wrong, but I believe this is a description of the end. The Antichrist will lead this coalition of nations against tiny little Israel. But Israel will be an immovable rock. Why? Because God is watching out for Israel. Verse 4 says, On that day I will blind all the horses of, of the nations. Now I'm speculating here, but I wonder if this prophecy has something to do with Israel's technological capability to literally blind their enemy satellites and advanced radar systems which have incredible surveillance capability. I don't know, but that's what I'm, I'm speculating here. Perhaps this, you know, if, if advancing armies are suddenly blinded, they'll be rendered helpless. Perhaps this verse explains, or this helps explain verse 4 when it says that on that day I will strike every horse with panic and its riders with madness. Imagine flying a military bomber with no radar capability. Just think about trying to land a plane without radar. Or driving a tank whose radar suddenly fails. Regardless of what actually happens, the Lord is keeping a watchful eye over Israel for their physical protection. Moreover, God is even more concerned about their spiritual protection, which is why He will bring them through the refining fire once again. Have you often noticed that God has to bring us through the refining fire to do something spiritual with us? Because we're so stubborn. You know, the Bible says that the, uh, the Jews are a stubborn and obstinate people. And, but we all are. Are we not? When someone comes up to me and says, Russ, how come the Jews don't believe? Do you know what I say? How come the Gentiles don't believe? <laughs> there are a lot of Jews who believe. And there are a lot of Gentiles who don't believe. We're all stubborn. Zechariah 13, verses 8 and 9 seems to address how the Lord is going to, going to bring them through the fire. In the whole land, declares the Lord, in the whole land of Israel, two-thirds will be struck down and perish, yet one-third will be left in it. This third I will bring into the fire. I will refine them like silver and test them like gold. And then look what they will do. They will call on my name, 
and I will answer them. I will say, they are my people. And they will say, and they're going to be looking at Jesus, the Lord is our God. I personally believe that two-thirds of the Jews living in Israel today will be killed in the next major war in the Middle East. That means millions of Jews are going to perish, many of them without Christ. However, the remaining one-third will survive, and this remnant will be purged of its sin when they cry out to Jesus. Zechariah 12, verse 10, seems to address this. It says, And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me, the one they pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. Who is Zechariah talking about? This one that was pierced. Jesus. The Apostle Paul writes in Romans 11, 25 and 26, I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of Gentiles has come in, and so all Israel will be saved. You Right now, when you look at all the Jews in the world, they've experienced a hardening in part. And what that means is, is that many and most of the Jews do not believe that Jesus is the Messiah. But a lot of them do. I mean, Joel Rosenberg, Lon Solomon, uh, who's the, the pastor that got saved on the street, uh, Franklin Street in Chapel Hill by a street preacher. Uh, Stan Telson wrote a book called Betray. These are just three. Uh, Marty Getz is a classical pianist that, that I've brought to Raleigh to play before. These are all Jewish people. Uh, Jason Goebel, who I bumped into in Jerusalem, he was in seminary with me. He's, he's a, he's a, these are all Messianic Jews. And you know what they're doing? They're busy taking the gospel to their people, the Jews. That's what the ministry Chosen People Ministries does, which is, I think, based out of Charlotte. They, these are, there are ministries right now that are taking the gospel even out on the streets of, of Jerusalem. The one-third who are delivered through the fire of God's judgment will comprise all of Israel at that point in history. This one-third will be the only Jewish survivors of the coming war about to break out in the Middle East. And they will in unison call out to Jesus and say, The Lord is our God. And in that moment, they will all be saved. That's what Paul is writing about, I believe, in, uh, in Romans when he says, And all Israel will be saved. He's not saying that all Jews are going to be saved. He says this remnant... Is going to be saved. Because what is happening right now, men, is the gospel for the last 2,000 years has been going out to the, the Gentile nations. The Apostle Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. That's why you're sitting here tonight, largely because of the Apostle Paul. But at some point, when the full number of Gentiles has come in, you remember God measures things, He measures sin. He's also measuring the number of Gentiles who are saved. And at some point, only God knows when. When the last Gentile has believed, the gospel is going to go back to the, where it began, back to the Jews. And who will be saved? Those whose names are written in the book, the book of life. What is the book of life? This book is mentioned all throughout the Bible. Next to the Bible, it is the most important book in the world. Revelation chapter 20, verses 12 and 15, mention this book. John writes, And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. What is the book of life? It is the, it is the divine register of all the saved throughout history. Mike Ellis gave us a great definition tonight. It's Jesus' book containing all the names of the individuals he purchased with his blood. It is the, a complete list of everyone who's been declared righteous by God. Those in the Old Testament who lived before the cross believed by faith in the promises of God that he was going to send a Messiah into the world. Remember Abraham? It says, and Abraham believed and it was credited to him as righteousness. The book of life. Those who live on this side of the cross look to the same scriptures and believe in the Messiah who has come. And their names too have been written in the book of life. So the Old Testament believers are looking forward to the coming of Jesus and we look back to the Jesus who has already come. And so we're all looking to the same point in history and it's that cross. And by faith, God declares us all righteous. 
and he writes our names in the Lamb's Book of Life. Has your name been written in the Book of Life? Have you ever heard this taught in your church? It's only the second most important book in the world. How come your ministers never told you about it? I'm not going to go down that path. I'm sorry, but I just can't help it. You see, if your name is not written in that book, then guess what? You will never enter heaven. How can you know that your name is written in that book? Receive Jesus Christ into your heart by faith. The last days will witness both a great, a time of great distress, but also a time of great revival for Israel. And secondly, the last days will bring about the resurrection of the dead and the final judgment. Did you know this? Every, every single person, both believers and non-believers alike, at some point in the future will be raised from their graves. Look at verses 2 and 3. It says, multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness, they will shine like the stars forever and ever. Did you know that everyone is going to be raised from the dead one day? Everyone. Those who rejected Christ, who refused God's grace and mercy, who stubbornly live their lives as if there's no God, will find themselves standing men before the great white throne where Jesus will be their judge. Can you imagine what that scene will be like? At that point, that day of grace is over with. Revelation 20, verse 11 and 12 says, and this again is John looking into the future. He says, Then I saw a great white throne in Him who was seated on it. Who's seated on it? Jesus. Earth and sky fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. That means there's no place to hide. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Here's what David Jeremiah writes about this judgment. As John sees the great white throne, he sees the dead. The dead who die without Christ, the spiritually dead. Their bodies are summoned from the graves and from the sea. Their souls are called from death in Hades to stand before the judge of all the earth. And John says this group will be made up of small and great. That's an expression that appears often in the Bible. And over five times this expression appears in the book of Revelation. It's there to remind us that all classes of people will be present from all ranks of the church and the world. There will be many religious people at the great white throne philanthropists and preachers, miracle workers and lay people. Erwin Lutz, who's another great minister up in Chicago, says this multitude is diverse in its religions. We see Buddhists and Muslims and Hindus and Protestants and Catholics and Baptists and Presbyterians, all standing there. We see those who believed in one God and those who believed in many gods. We see those who refused to believe in any God at all. We see those who believed in meditation as a means of salvation and those who believed that doing great deeds was, like, was the path to eternal life. We see the moral and the immoral, the priest and the prophet. What will happen to these religious people, men, when they stand before God? Guys, this is why I harp on this so much. Religion is the greatest tool in the hands of Satan to keep the vast majority of our friends blind and lost. Do you realize that? And I'm not the only one saying this. This is coming from David Jeremiah and Erwin Lutz, two of the greatest preachers in America. What will happen to these religious people when they stand before God? This is what Jeremiah says. He says, let the Lord answer that question. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, Jesus says, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Did y'all get my devotion this week? And I, it's about um, you have to know Jesus personally to be saved. Contrary to public opinion, believing in your chosen truth does not make it true. There's only one truth, and that's the truth of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I'm the way and the truth and the life. Believe in that truth or you will not go to the Father. That is what Jesus said in John 14, 6. I am the way and the truth and the life. And the part that's left out of a lot of liberal funerals, no one comes to the Father 
except through me. Do what? That's your version. Your verse. You like that verse? Good, I do too. I think Jesus likes it too. See, man, this is the great judgment that's coming for non-believers. Here's the good news. You ready for the good news? Not a single believer will be standing in front of the great, great white throne judge, judgment. Not a single believer. Do you know why? Because the people that are standing there are waiting to be condemned. <laughs> They're waiting for their sins to be judged. Where have our sins been judged? Right there. So here's the choice to the world. Have them judged right there, you get a free pass into heaven. Or have them judged on that day, and you get a free pass into hell. That's really the choice. And it's that simple. If a man from Bethel can understand that, anybody can understand it. Amen. How do I know that no believers will stand at the great white throne judgment? Because the Bible tells me. And because the sins of believers were all nailed to the cross, and there they were judged. All believers stand forgiven. And they are also very much alive. That's why it says the dead are summoned to the great white throne. They're dead because they're not in Christ. The only ones standing at this throne of judgment are the dead. Paul writes about the legal condition of believers in Romans 8.1 when he says, Therefore, and the word therefore is pointing back to Romans 1-7 through 7, where he's walked us through. We did this study a few years ago. He's told us what it means to be a Christian without being religious. It has nothing to do with religion. It has everything to do with a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so when you figure that out and you receive Jesus into your heart by faith, men, then, then God declares you righteous. And Paul writes over your, over your whole life, therefore there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Do you know how much condemnation I would get if I hadn't been covered by the blood of Christ? And I'm talking about the stuff I've done as a Christian. I've abused God's grace, but I'm still, <laughs> because of His unbelievable mercy and grace, I'm still covered by the blood of the Lamb, and I know when I die, there won't be a condemning judge there. There's going to be a welcoming Savior, like the father of the prodigal saying, welcome home, Russ. Do you, do you got want to hear that? Welcome home. <laughs> and just believe. Now, there's a place where we're going to be judged. But it's, I wouldn't call it a real judge. Well, I, I would call it a judgment, but it's a good kind of judgment. Believers, we will also be raised from the dead. And we, we're going to be given bodies that will be changed in the twinkling of an eye. And those bodies, by the way, will be, help me if I forget the right words, guys, imperishable, immortal, glorious, supernatural and powerful. Spiritual is a work for supernatural. That's the, that's the body you're going to receive. And we will stand before Jesus at what is known as the Bema. Bema is the Greek word that we translate judgment seat. Paul writes about this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. He says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Why? That each one of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. I think that good or bad simply means eternal or temporal. Because there's no condemnation. 2 Corinthians, by the way, is a letter that Paul wrote to all the believers in the, in his, the church he founded in Corinth. And so when he says, For we all... He's talking about we who? Believers. It's a letter written to believers. So Paul says, for we must all appear. So what is this judgment seat? Well, Paul, when he wrote this, he had the Greek games in mind. And the judges sat at the Bema, the judgment seat. In fact, I've been to Corinth, and I, I saw the first time I went, I've told you all this story a bunch of times, but Big Rock, and it had a brass plaque that had the Greek letters B-E-M-A. And I remember standing there, well, here's the Bema. <laughs> this is what Paul was talking about. And it's just a platform where the judges sat at the Greek games to give out the gold and silver and bronze medal to the winners, to the victors. Jesus is waiting for us men to stand before him one day where we can be rewarded 
What's that reward going to be like? Well, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 through 15. His, his house is going to work. By the grace, Paul says, by the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as an expert builder. And someone else is building on it. But each one should be careful how he builds. In other words, men, we need to be careful. If you're in Christ, you need to be careful how you're living your life. For no one can lay any foundation other than one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If any man builds on this foundation, in other words, if any man lives his life based on your relationship with Jesus, using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, his work will be shown for what it is because the day, that's that expression again, the day of God's judgment will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. If it is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. You don't want to enter heaven with your tails on fire. Your feathers, tail feathers. You see, a Christian's life is built upon his relationship with Jesus. Jesus is the foundation. But we need to be careful how we live. Because one day we will stand before the Lord and we will give an account of our life. All of our works, all the deeds that we've done. Remember in Ephesians 1, excuse me, 2 verse 10, it says that God has prepared good works in advance for us to do. So he's got something he wants you guys to do. And so what, I, what I'd recommend you do is that you go invite some friends to come back next September. And did you go tell your friends and your family members who you're not sure where they are about Jesus? Invite them to come here, Kieran, next uh, Tuesday night. That's what um, Andrew did. He went and got his brother Peter and brought him and said, come see the Savior. You can get your brother, your sister, your friend, your neighbor, and bring them next Tuesday night. Bring them to Jesus. And guess what? Those, those are good deeds that you're doing because you want to glorify God, and you're doing them by faith. And those are the ones that will last forever. If a Christian is saved, gets saved, he is saved, and just lives the rest of his life for himself, seeing how much money he can accumulate, spend on himself, how much fun he can have. And there's nothing wrong with having fun, guys. I'm not knocking that. But if that's the focus of your life as a Christian, then guess what? When you stand before Jesus, all that's going to pass through the fire like wood, hay, and straw, and what's going to happen to it? Burn up. You have nothing left. Verse 3 says, Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Where's your first missionary field? Your what? Your family. Your wife, your children, your parents. Where's your next mission field? Place of work, your friends you play golf with. Remember the poem, My Friend, written from the guy who went to hell, your friend that went to hell, and he's writing you a letter back on earth, saying, My friend, I stand the judgment now and feel like you're to blame somehow. You knew the Lord in truth and glory, but never did you tell the story. And now I'm coming to this end. I can no longer call you my friend. Do you want to get that letter while you're walking into heaven and your friend is going to another place? We need to remember the words of C.T. Studd, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Now back to Daniel. Can you imagine being Daniel at this point in his life? He's now an old man. He's been told about the coming time of trouble for his people, and he's greatly concerned. And Daniel looked to the man dressed in linen and asked him, How long will it be before these astonishing things are fulfilled? And the man clothed in linen said, It will be for time, times, and half a time. When the power of the holy people has been finally broken, all these things will be completed. Daniel heard, but he didn't understand. And so the Lord told his aged prophet, Go your way, Daniel, because the words are closed up and sealed until the time of the end. Many will be purified, made spotless and refined, but the wicked will continue to be wicked. None of the wicked will understand, but those who rise will understand. As for you, go your way to the end. You will rest, and then at the end of, the, of your days, you will rise to receive your allotted inheritance. Daniel was not told how long it would be before these things took place. But he was told how long they would last. The time of distress that is coming upon the nation of Israel will last three and a half years. 
It will be the last half of the tribulation, known as the Great Tribulation. As the birth pains that you can read about in Matthew 24 become more frequent and more intense, many will be saved. But don't you find it interesting that the wicked, those outside of Christ, will continue in their wickedness, and they will not be able to understand what is happen, happening. You want to see something wicked? You watch what is going on right now in the abortion debate. When you've got one, and I'm sorry I keep pounding this, you want my friend Zach Brady, I've talked, Zach Brady, I've talked to you about him before, who goes and stands at the abortion clinic and tries to save babies. Tonight he stood before the Raleigh City Council. He texted me this morning, said, pray for me tonight at 7 o'clock. He stood before the Raleigh City Council to see if they would declare the city of Raleigh a sanctuary for the unborn. I doubt that passed. That's a lone man fighting on the front lines. And I guarantee you when Zach Brady steps into heaven, he's going to hear two words. Well done. Welcome home. We've had the privilege, I'm almost done, this year to study one of the most fascinating books in the Bible. And we've learned a lot about what is coming upon our world. Most of the people that you and I know, some of our family members and, and many of our friends are clueless. They're just like the people of Noah's day. While Noah was building the ark and warning the people of God's coming judgment, most laughed at him, scoffed at him, and turned a deaf ear. Jesus said in Matthew 24, verses 36 through 42, No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying, and, and being given in marriage. Up to the day Noah entered the ark, and they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Therefore, Jesus says, keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. When he does come in, just like Daniel, if you're in Christ, we will rise to receive our allotted inheritance, and we will each stand before Jesus. And so as you leave her tonight, I want this thought to linger in your mind. Are you prepared for that day? Are you ready to stand before Jesus and give an account of your life? If not, why not make sure tonight? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, dear God, that you have shown your light. You've shined your light in this room. You know, thank you, Lord, for these men. Lord, they um, don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. But I pray that you would honor the fact that they have taken two hours to be here tonight. And I pray that you would bless them. I pray that you would draw them to yourself, that they would know that they have eternal life. And that one day when they pass through death's door, they will step into paradise. And I pray to God that you would help us all to be prepared for that day, that we might live for you while we still have the daytime. And Lord, until you come, we want to give you all the praise and glory and honor. Come, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. See you next week.